Okay. Okay, let's get started. Welcome. Welcome to uh, this week's uh, HAO Colloquium. And today we have uh, Dr. Jean-Francois Cosset uh, from CU. Uh, actually, an advertisement, you are still at uh, Montreal. Uh, actually, Jean-Francois received, recently received his PhD in physics uh, from the University of Montreal, Canada. And his advisor is uh, no stranger to us. Sorry, Brian, you are, OK. Uh, and his uh, advisor is uh, Paul Shabno, um, and uh, he's worked with Paul for six years since uh, his graduate year, uh, undergraduate years. And he's now a George uh, Allery Hill postdoc fellow at the CU Boulder, uh, working mainly with uh, Mark Rest. Uh, his re research focuses on the study of solar convection using uh, MHD simulations. Thank you. Yes. So, <clears throat> so I. So I did my just uh, finished my PhD in uh, November, and a week after I was here, I mean I defended, and a week after I was here. So uh, very happy to be back in Boulder. Uh, part of the work I I did in my PhD was uh, uh, touched upon the uh, magnet, well, uh, man magnetic modulation of uh, convective heat transport. And it's work I did uh, together with Paul, but also with uh, Pure Peter Smolarkovich, uh, who is uh, uh, one of the main developers of the uh, OILAG MHD code, which I've been using to do solar, to study solar convection. And recently, uh, also uh, collaborating with Mark uh, at, at CAU and LASP. So just put ourselves in context. Um, why are we? Why I'm interested in uh, convective heat transport and uh, its modulation by magnetic activity is uh, related to irradiance. We know varies on time scales of days and months, but also on the time scale of the 11-year solar cycle. Uh, right now, there are uh, there's a growing consensus that those variations, most of those variations, if not all of those variations, are due to to uh, the changing surface coverage by magnetic structures such as uh, sunspots, faculae, and network, uh, with dips and rises on time, time scales of weeks due to uh, the passage of active regions on the solar disk, and the uh, whereas the Elvenier component would be due to the overcompensate, overcompensating effect of facula and network uh, of the overcompensating effect of that. Uh, of sunspot darkening. What is in very encouraging is that irradiance reconstruction models that use only those two types of effect uh, can model up to uh, 90, 90, 97 percent of the variation, the the variance, on and up to even 92 percent on the on the decadal time scales. So really, there is. Uh, Strong. Um, there are strong arguments to say that those two are the only uh, mechanisms uh, modulating the irradiance. But there is also the possibility that a um, change in the thermal dynamic structure or convective heat efficiency, convective uh, transport efficiency, could affect the uh, total output, luminous output at the surface. And really, this is kind of this is uh, this has formed the basis of a debate that's been opposing two broad school of thoughts regarding the ultimate origin of DSI variations. The first one says that all all variations, all fluctuations that are observed, are solely the result of uh, surface coverage by magnetic structures. The second of those. The other school of thought, which I'm going to be interested in now, says that, well, OK, you, you have where there's the dominance of uh, surface, pure surface FX. But to really account for all the, all the variations, you need to take into account the modulation of uh, such things as convect, uh, convective heat efficiency by magnetic activity uh, or uh, nature 
need to take into account global uh, deformation of the thermodynamic structure with magnetic activity. So, Yeah, well, there there are really strong opinions. I mean, different that people. yeah, different people. <laughs> that well, well, those uh, as I've uh, said that the the irradiance reconstruction models that are using purely you know they use magnetograms and oh, in, the, in other words they use purely surface effects. To account to reconstruct the irradiance. Yeah, right. But um, I mean, the question is: Are those, if they exist, are those thermally uh, thermal stru structural changes significant enough to take them into account? To that we should take them into account for, uh, especially on the long long time scales, like decadal and longer. Because the, the, the short-term variations are really well, extremely well reproduced by surface, pure surface effects. So that's, I think that's the crux of, like, say about, yeah, like, for instance, the Maunder minimum. What, what goes on at the Maunder minimum? Does the convective, would the, would the convective uh, heat modulation be more uh, import, important with that respect? since there are non-trivial uh, changes in the surface coverage. So that's what I'm interested in here. This question of could, could such an effect um, really occur in, in the sun, in the deep layers? And to do that, we need to solve the full set of self-consistent uh, uh, MHD equations do, doing that with the uh, Euler MHD model, it's uh, well documented in the literature. It used to be, uh, it started as a purely hydro uh, model for um, atmospheric circulation, but eventually uh, it developed into a, it, a MHD clone, if you wish, was developed to study solar convection. Euler MHD is uh, based on finite volume integration of analytic MHD equations. And, oops. So we solve the analytic version of the equation. Here um, is potential, temp uh, potential temperature equation. Instead, we use potential temperature instead of entropy because of the, it's, that's an, if you wish, uh, because Eulag's, um, historically, because of Eulag's use in atmospheric models, uh, potential temperature instead of entropy was used. But it's, 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 it, maps to the, it maps to the entropy um, and s simply m provides a measure of the specific entropy. So you can think of it as entropy. Two special features of our approach is that uh, we, we do not use uh, explicit diffusion in any of those uh, in any of those uh, evolution equations. The dissipation is delegated to the MP data, to the truncation terms of the MP data algorithm. Uh, we sometimes use, uh, I mean, the the, run, the experiment I'm going to talk about uses a bit of uh, magnetic dissipation, but nothing. It's really small. The other aspect of our forcing uh, approach, which we use to force convection, is that we do not use uh, the classical way of forcing convection, which is uh, specifying fluxes at the bottom and top of the bo domain. So it, it, it's not a boundary valley problem. It's, it's, um, it's rather a relaxation problem. And here I'm going to explain that just a little bit. Um, so, so the perturbation, so we, show, we solve a perturbation form of the entropy equation. And the perturbation itself is with respect to 
what we call the ambient state, theta, theta e. Um, the, the, the ambient state is, um, um, represents a, is used to represent a stable, uh, convectively stable stratification in the, um, in the uh, part corresponding to the radiative interior, whereas it has a, it is slightly super adiabatic in the unstable layer above the, tach uh, the tachocline region. And typical value, so this uh, ambient state is, uh, the, so the level of super adiabaticity is typical of uh, 10 minus 6, 10 minus 4, 10 minus 4 and so it's consistent with uh, heliosismic, heliosismic and uh, heliosismically calibrated uh, solar structural models. So what happens, oops, what happens if we just let, uh, so we are, so we just let, we just specify some initial very small perturbation and let the system evolve, we have hot fluid rising, cold parcel, uh, cold fluid sinking, which eventually leads to a neutral uh, profile. So to prevent that and to keep forcing convection, we we use a relaxation, Newtonian relaxation term here, which damps the entropy, pertur entropy perturbations or potential temperature uh, departures from the ambient state on, a, on some time scale, which is given by uh, the inverse of alpha here, which is about uh, 20 solar days. And th so this prevents the restratification to a neutrally stable uh, state. A month, 28 days. Yeah, so yeah. this is like on the time scale 20 rotation periods is the relaxation. That's the relaxation. Yeah, yeah, okay. correct. Yeah. So this this has led to, uh, uh, so, um, so here is the, so those are angular velocity, uh, mean angular, angular velocity profiles in the uh, hydro regime and MHD regime. So, we get the, essentially the same, basically it's the same features as uh, other uh, convective dynamos, uh, convective um, solar global convection simulations such as ASH, such as the ASH code, uh, with a super rotation at the equator and slow poles. Um, same thing with the uh, kind of uh, pretty much aligned uh, cylindrical contours, ISO contours of the angular velocity. In the MHD case, we get a reduced, almost three times reduced, uh, smaller contrast between the um, equatorial uh, differential rotation and, and the poles. I wouldn't know, honestly, but uh, exactly. I mean, um, I guess basically it's because you know, torsional oscillations are thermal. Yeah, um, so yeah, thermal wind. But what what this uh, my colleague Patrice Baudouin has done the analysis of the the force balance acting in this in the uh, momentum. Solar momentum equation, and he found that there is a complex interplay of all the terms on the right hand side. I I don't think he looked at the at the what was going on in the uh, uh, the entropy equation to see if the there was a. I don't think he looked at the thermal wind specifically, so I wouldn't know. So I so I yeah yeah I'm, I. I'm not sure. So, so those those simulations are initialized with a small-scale magnetic field, which eventually builds up to a, a large-scale uh, toroidal component, which peaks uh, close to at the interface, slightly beneath the interface of the uh, stable layer and the convective, convectively unstable layer. 
that here is a uh, um, contour map of the uh, toroidal uh, component of the magnetic, magnetic field. So we have those uh, high latitude ref that, um, that are generated. And yes. So in, in addition, we have, um, so that again is a model ID prediction, prediction of the toroidal component, which shows that basically, which shows the polarity reversals, which here occurs on a period of uh, 40 years. Um, that's just a uh, cross-section uh, cross, cross showing the long, uh, zonally average, average in longitude, uh, average of the toroidal component. So it's kind of uh, peaks at high latitudes, about 50 degrees, which is a bit higher than what you would want to, um, I mean, compared to what we see from the emergence of sunspot at the surface. But still, um, if you look at a so-called, at the butterfly diagram analog of our simulation, which is uh, plotted here, um, uh, there is a weak tendency for equatorward propagation of each ref along the cycle, over the course of the cycle. Um, that's, that's, oh, yeah. So that's just latitude and time. I forgot to specify sometimes. And this is uh, radius and time. Again, for the zonally average component. So, um, yeah. So this is what you would expect um, given that you take for, um, if, if assuming that the uh, flux ropes, which are stored beneath uh, in, the, in, uh, in the stable layer would uh, buoyantly uh, destabilize and rise to the surface to produce the active regions, that's what you would expect uh, to find. No, we, uh, no. I mean, it's the only parameters in our simulations are basically you have a rotation rate and of the uh, reference system and the uh, Newton and cooling time scale. In addition, you could also change the stratification of the ambient profile, which would change the luminosity, basically. So those are the only two knobs, if you wish. Uh, three knobs, yeah. Yeah. Do they have any effect? Yeah, uh, yes. But the, que the solutions are kind of sensitive to to those uh, terms, but I can, yeah, come back later. <laughs> so what? So that's all nice, but what I'm interested in here is uh, con uh, convective heat transport, and so I need to. So to so I need to look uh, have a deeper look at the how the flow structure evolves as a function of time. And here's just a uh, so views of the uh, contour plots of the radial velocity, uh, per temperature perturbation uh, uh, with respect to a, uh, to the uh, uh, state, spherical mean state, state mean state on a spherical shell. And the product of those two leads to the enthalpy flux, gives the enthalpy flux which transports the heat. Um, Two very two important features of uh, uh, this kind of this type of convection are the broad network of broad upflows and narrow downflow lanes at located at mid high latitudes and the north south aligned um, banana cells which are kind of here uh, just a bit difficult to see those banana cells which are closer to the equator and so we are gonna. I'm just going to look at how the, so changing those two changes the uh, enthalpy flux. And when you integrate the, you just take the convective luminosity on different shells, you find that the uh, convective heat luminosity varies in phase with the total magnetic energy of the simulation. And this has been published in the uh, APGL letter. So the question is, uh, could, could this 
uh, effect uh, really take place in the real sun. Could you possibly go back to your previous? Yes. What is happening where you have your belt of green in the middle of the top? Um, is it the equatorial region? Yes. And, and so it's a region of very softened convection at near the surface, 0.94 on the left panel? Yeah. So yes. the bananas don't come through. They're really yeah. they have a very mild signature there. Yeah. I haven't looked at that in detail to the banana cells because uh, the I mean what I found is that uh, most of the flux is carried by the network of broad up flows and down narrow downflow lanes at the high latitudes. So I've really focused my analysis on this this part. And so you can you vary it principally at high latitude reads, right? Fifty degrees. Yes. Uh -huh. That there's a, an avoidance zone. Yes. Yeah, I haven't looked at that in I haven't looked at that in detail yet. Okay. So just just uh, so the so the, it's a zero flux of potential temperature. So that effectively we just there's only the Newton and cooling which uh, re prevents restratification by damping the entropy perturbations. Yeah. So. No, it's uh, 20 solar days, which means uh, 20 months. Solar days? Yeah, solar days. Yeah. So where, where is this entropy in the latitude that takes advantage of the data that we have at the surface? It's within, so those are uh, within the bulk of the convective layer. Yeah. yeah. That's what I'm going to be looking at. And so the, the modulation pervades the whole convective layer here. Those are. Those crosses just represent the luminosity at uh, minimum and maximum. So uh, which one is the correlation coefficient? You have two the other. Oh, so. The yeah, so, OK. So the crosses are just the, so I take, if I take the, lumina, uh, the luminosity over each minima, there are like 32s. And every maxima, I get two different averages at each level. And those are the those are the, the black and red crosses which you see here. Ah, okay. okay. And if I just correlate the luminosity at each level with the magnetic energy, I get the correlation coefficient. You see, the black line. Yeah. The gradient should be relaxed towards that to drag it towards that entropy gradient. So what is actually the flux? Any flux to the absolute the absolute entropy. To the absolute flux. Oh, it's oh yeah, it's um, so it's our simulation is uh, if you take for instance the uh, luminosity in the say here, it reaches ten percent of the luminosity in the bulk. Okay. So it's kind of it's a bit sub subluminous. Okay, so so what we're interested in what physical mechanism is going to produce the mod the flux modulation? This can change uh, either as a result of uh, changes the modulation of radial velocity amplitude, amplitude or ter just if you just increase, modulate the temperature perturbations themselves, uh, or simply change the correlation between both, or a combination of all, <laughs> which is not, yeah, it's more complex. So first, I'm, I'm just going to take a quick look at how do those do the forces act on the flow, especially the now, if you take the Lorentz force and on the on the spherical shell, uh, those are so the blue values are negative, and so everything below the gray is negative, and here's uh, red and yellow is positive. Uh, we're interested in how exactly does the Lorentz force act on the upflows and downflows, and so I came up with the way of uh, plotting this radial component of the Lorentz force, take a certain range of the radial velocity, u, uh, u plus du, u and u plus du, and a certain latitude range, and take the average Lorentz force in that specific range, OK? And plot it as a function of velocity and latitude. 
So the, the uh, right part here shows the upflows, and the left part shows the downflows. So what you find is that you have a predominance of uh, negative, so downward, uh, negative Lorentz force in the upflows and positive Lorentz force in the upflows, uh, downflows. So, which means that basically the Lorentz force is opposing the, uh, the, the flow motion, which was, yes? I think it's half. Yeah. So that's a snapshot. That's actually this picture, uh, the, this small YD projection. I just took this snapshot, and I uh, performed this this type of average over every over lat just over certain velocity range and certain latitude range. And then the depth. No, 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 no. There's no depth. There's no question of depth here. It's only it, it's on a spherical surface, spherical shell. Yeah. And if you take the buoyancy, you get the opposite effect. So you get a, a, a positive upward acceleration in the upflows and downward acceleration in the downflows. So how exactly is the Lorentz force modulated? So just come back here. So if I so if I take a, an average. Uh, of the Lorentz force in the upflows, I just consider a different average of the Lorentz force inside uh, the upflows and the downflows, and do that. Do the average, average this quantity over if every ma maxima and every minima. I get this plot, which uh, which shows the change in the Lorentz force uh, as a function of depth. For every uh, for maxima and minima, and what you see is that uh, well, what you, you get what you expect, especially in the downflows, you get an increase of the Lorentz force, which is especially gets stronger as you uh, approach the middle of the bulk, the middle of the convection zone, whereas the change in the Lorentz in the in the, in the upflows, which are the the squares here um, is uh, not as trivial. I mean, it's not stronger everywhere. You get, uh, for instance, here you get a smaller Lorentz force. OK, so, so as, ex as, as, as we expect, as we expect, Lorentz force opposes the buoyancy force and therefore the flow motion in the upflows and the downflows. Why then does the intensification of the magnetic field leads to a enhanced convective heat transport at cycle maximum? So, under, so to answer this question, we basically we need to look at uh, the various how each flow feature is modulated uh, by the, um, with the with magnetic activity, and so that's those just shows the the correlation of temperature perturbations with velocity flux and velocity flux and temperature at various levels in the simulation. So we basically have cool uh, downflows and hot warm upflows, which produce a uh, positive uh, enthalpy flux. We do have a, um, a few, uh, a, a smaller fraction of flux values that are negative, which um, is associated with uh, turbulent entrainment turbulent flow, uh, uh, turbulent entrainment of hot fluid downwards and uh, cold fluid upwards. And so we ask uh, how those features change with magnetic activity. I'm just going to look at, uh, so I just look at the PDFs of the uh, enthalpy flux at different levels in the simulation. And if I average those PDFs over every maxima and every minima, I get the uh, orange, the red, red and black curves that you see here, respectively. So the and the, the black uh, solid curve is just the difference between those two PDFs here. So you see that uh, that most 
significant change occurs in the tails of the flux distribution. And that's uh, for every, at each level. Whereas you have a bit of suppression of turbulent fluid entrainment in the negative part of the uh, enthalpy flux uh, range. That's not a logarithmic scale, right? Sorry? It's a logarithmic scale, right? It is, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. The, it's the difference between those two PDF. Uh, it's not on the. It's on the linear scale. Okay. Yeah. So you have a change in magnetic energy, like the delta is uh, or psycho whatever. What is that compared to the average? Uh, uh, like the time of the magnetic field is always like the certain magnetic. Right. Energy. Right. I didn't look at it. Yeah. I don't. Know. Uh, so if you if you want to so that's just a PDF. If you want to know, yeah. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt. When you say that it's most efficient in the tail, okay, but uh, there's a lot there's a there's a large difference in the core, and most and the, there's a lot of points in the core. So you would integrate over the over the difference in the PDF. Wouldn't it be the core that dominates? Yeah. So that's why you need to look at the luminosity contribution of it of each equivalent corresponding luminosity contribution of each pin. Because those values in the bulk, in the core, have very low flux. So if you do that, uh, you find that the difference is, is effective. It's, that, that's what I, that, that, those are the, so this plot shows the contribution of each, each flux bin to the, to the luminosity. And when you do that, you see that the, really the contribution comes from the tails. The change in the luminosity comes from the flux tails. A lot of change, but no oomph. The what? No oomph. Oomph? Well, <laughs> there isn't any flux in to play with. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, those are high flux values. Good. Yeah. So it's, OK. So now, uh, so the, so the, taking a look at the radial, the PDF of the radial velocity uh, and temperature perturbations PDF will hopefully tell us more of about what's going on. So again, uh, PDF of the radial velocity here. Um, see the asymmetry here, which is due to the weak density stratification, which which is specified by the uh, reference state of the analytic approximation. And what's apparent from those PDFs is the suppression of the tails, the, P, the, the velocity tails here, as you uh, go from minimum to maximum, which is consistent with the um, increased Lorentz force, uh, which, which uh, I've shown you earlier. Now, the change in the uh, temperature perturbation PDFs is less obvious. Uh, you get enhance heating of the uh, upfl um, upflows, which correspond to the positive perturbations, in the upper parts of the layer, convective layer here, whereas you get uh, no significant change in the downflows, uh, in the uh, cool elements. The opposite phenomenon, the opposite thing happens deeper down in the layer, whereas when you get uh, mm, cooling of the well, you get more negative flux values. And so here you have a, a change that's pretty symmetrical in the velocity PDF, whereas the change in the uh, temperature perturbation PDF is asymmetrical as you go uh, from top to bottom of the domain. So if you look, looking at those um, so again, if I look at the contribution of each velocity bin and each temperature bin to the luminosity, um, I can really, uh, we've, we really find that the, here, heating of the warm uh, upflows and in the upper part and cooling of the cooled, uh, cooling of the downflows in the lower parts is really what causes the uh, luminosity to change. The trick here is that the the change in the um, um, 
flux distribution is really asymmetric, which means it must be uh, due to the um, must be due to the must be caused rather by a temperature change because the since the since the, since the velocity PDF is symmetric. So, yeah, we do get a suppression of um, the velocity tails at the cycle maximum, but really, what what the PD, what those PDF shows is that the increase is either due to the um, increased magnitude of temperature perturbations or the correlation between both the velocity and temperature fluctuations. And so, to to understand what's doing those this heating in the upper part and cooling in the uh, lower part of the convective layer, we need to look at the entropy equation. We're using the um, so uh, mass continuity mass, con mass continuity equation to recast this equation in flux form. Uh, that's what we find. The div h here is uh, simply the horizontal divergence of the horizontal max mass flux. And here's just the radial component of the divergence. So if I just take a look at those, the magnitude of each term in, the, in this uh, entropy equation, I find that those two dominate. And we get a really, really insignificant contribution from the radiative flux and really small, much smaller contribution from Newton and cooling. So really, what, what we should look at if we want to understand what's heating uh, and doing the heating and cooling of the downflows and upflows, we should look at those two here. Um, so here, we really see that um, because, because of the inelastic uh, approximation, the mass, the mass continuity constrains the flow's response to the Lorentz force, and therefore also constrains the convective heat flux response to the magnetic cycle, which gives us some uh, um, intuition about how things should, should go. So if I look at the, uh, so that at the topology of upflows and downflows, um, take an upflow for instance, when I, so if I go from top, uh, bottom to top, I get a um, convergence, so accumulation of mass, mass accumulation at the bottom, and mass, uh, uh, mass divergence at the top, which are the, those are simply the signs of each uh, component of the mass continuity equation. And of course, I get the opposite uh, structure for the downflow. So, so we've seen that the Lorentz force opposes the buoyancy force and therefore inhibits the vertical motion. Moreover, if the magnitude of the change in Lorentz force with cyclic magnetic activity varies as a function of the, then the balance between the horizontal and vertical flow divergences will be upset. Because if you suppress, so if you, if you suppress the flow in such a way that you induce gradients in the velocity field, then uh, which means either increasing or decreasing this, this term here, this one is going to have to either increase or decrease. And this way you could drive, by doing this, you could drive heating or cooling of the flow of the structure, which, would, which is what we are after here. So just, that's just a cartoon picture of what could happen. So take for instance, an um, upflow, appro uh, say approaching the top of the domain, in which you have a accumulation of ma uh, mass here, therefore a um, dr greater than zero, and horizontal divergence, well, it's the negative here, be, be careful. Um, um, so mass, uh, so this dictates an outflow, horizontal outflow of mass to respect the mass continuity constraint. Now, going at cycle maximum, where you get suppression, 
So you have a change of the uh, level of suppression as a function of depth, as I mentioned earlier, then you actually effectively increase this term here. And this term has to go down. So just let's just take a look at that, if this picture is consistent with what we see in the uh, simulation. So if I just take um, the same, do the same type of uh, averaging procedure which I did earlier for the Lorentz force and the buoyancy force um, <coughs> over a certain, so the, say the um, negative at the horizontal divergence of the mass flux in a certain velocity and latitude range, and I plot it at two different levels, near the bottom and the top of the convective layer, I get essentially a, oops, so down here at 0.76, I get a negative, um, negative, um, is that right? I think I flipped something. Um, so negative, um, wait. Yes, OK. So yes, you have a negative horizontal, uh, negative of the horizontal uh, mass flux divergence at the bottom because you have mass ex uh, and a horizontal outflow, of mass outflow, whereas, uh, whereas in the uh, Upflows here, you get you have mass entering the uh, entering the upflow. Therefore, you have a, um, a positive term here. This one's positive, and you get exactly the opposite scenario at in the uh, close to the um, top of the domain. So according to this, those what we see here, this picture is consistent. Now what, what's the, what really interests us is uh, how those things evolve with time. How, how does the flow topology, the upflow and downflow topology evolves as a function of time? So here I've taken, um, so I've taken the um, average uh, horizontal divergence and radial divergence in the upflow, in the upflows, and the same type of average over the uh, upflows for the corresponding heating terms. And I plotted them as a function of time here, uh, and as a function, well, here, uh, showing the evolution of total magnetic energy. So. Let's just take a look at this plot for a second. Um, so those two terms should always cancel, which are the black dash curve here and the uh, solid curve. And that's effectively, that's what we see those. Of course, that's, that's obvious that they should cancel. Um, but we really see that those two components are heavily modulated by the magnetic cycle and that they have a response that the response is seen in the uh, horizontal divergence of the heat flux here, which is providing, which is effectively uh, here a heating term for the upflows. So we have a scenario in which uh, this term goes down and this one goes up when going from cycle minima to maxima. And therefore, yes. That's what I said. And this is compatible with the increase of temperature in the warm upflows, which we have seen in the temperature PDFs. Now for the uh, downflow structure, that's at the top of this, near the, close to the top, 0.88. So in the downflow structure, we get the uh, um, reverse phenomenon, which is an increase of the uh, horizontal uh, divergence of the mass flux here. And we still see the signature 
of that change in the uh, divergence of the temperature uh, heat fluxes. However, those two, um, so the difference between the two are instead of being in phase, instead of be having those, those two varying in phase, they vary in opposite phase, which may, I think, be why we don't see the uh, um, uh, cooling uh, or significant heating or cooling in the downflows at the top. And that's what the temperature PDF showed us. So little, little net heating in the downflows. OK, so. goes down. Uh, possibly. I didn't check that. Yeah. So, yeah. So, that I, so that's the, in my conclusions. I, I really need to that's really heuristic right now. Uh, I I, um, I need to do the but the, the the budget the full uh, budget to take account also implicit dissipation by the MP data to see what's what's really going on. And but there is there is a significant uh, signature in those uh, flux divergence. Yeah, you can see it. And. So to summarize, we have this global MHD simulation achieving uh, solo-like magnetic cycles showing enhanced convective heat luminosity at maximum, and some radial flow suppression by the Lorentz force. And so this work I've done uh, recently, essentially, the arg um, what I think it would, what shows is that we, you, although you have this suppression by the Lorentz force, having a radial dependent, dependence of that modulation of that radial flow suppression could drive um, horizontal flow heat, uh, heat flow in the in those structures, and therefore provide the explanation we're looking for to explain the enhanced heat transport. So the ongoing work need, as I said, need to perform the accurate budget to really pin really uh, um, find, I mean, really I uh, find what the, what's the role, find out what's the role of each uh, component in the entropy equation. And then uh, we have this, we have a, I, there's a simulation at higher using a, a smaller damping time scale, uh, which shows, also shows the modulation of the convective heat transport but I haven't analyzed it yet, so I need to see if that same kind of mechanism is operating. And of course, it would be interesting to repeat the analysis for higher rotation rates uh, and ultimately predict potential, pot uh, potential observational signatures, such as a modulation of the P-mode uh, oscillation frequencies. There's been some. Uh, uh, work done on that, uh, which shows that there is a modulation modulation of the PMO frequency shifts. Because if you change the convective heat transport efficiency, you change the thermal structure, which uh, gives the sound speed for the for the PMO. And so it would be interesting to see if such a such, a, such an effect is detectable using helio seismology. Thank you. Questions for John as well? Yes. Uh, I just. So, do you think that the way you drive your system to so this relaxation term that, that has any influence on these findings for the luminosity? Would you expect to see the same effect if you drive it to an energy flux to the system? That's a good question. I don't know the answer, but what I what I would tell you is, are those elements which you, which you see here that the suppression the the way we suppress the flow with the Lorentz force, 
uh, is that a viable you know, mechanism in itself, not taking into account the uh, Eugene cooling? Yeah, and the other question is, is this mostly a change of the energy flux in the convection zone, or do you think this actually need, leads to a change you could observe in the photosphere? The photosphere, the only thing it cares about is what is the entropy of material coming up in the center of granules. Yeah. So the question is, would this mechanism modulate that value, or would it basically, this is a modulation which is hidden from anything we can observe, and just yeah. it somewhere in the convection zone. Um, I would say that <coughs> since, well, there has been some arguments that since the thermal relaxation time of the f convective envelope is huge, hundreds of thousands of years, uh, there would be, if there would be a flux modulation deep down in the convective zone, we wouldn't see it because of that. Uh, but that's really based on the diffusive argument uh, picture of convection. Um, the question is, can we can we have this type of could we could we have this type of effect still? At, uh, I mean, with those. Uh, I mean, is this? The question is, is this type of mechanism uh, also um, a good viable explanation for higher Reynolds number, where you, ha you, you can't do this approximation, diffusive approximation anymore? But I mean, in, here in the simulation, we first of all, we stop at 0.96, and we don't go any further. And we impose an impen impenetrable boundary at the top. So it's hard to tell anything about what's going in the upper SCZ and the, and, and the Z and convection zone. Who? Who is the? So, okay, yes. so, so we have um, really accurate measurements of the total solar radiance. Yes. Um, but I don't believe we have accurate measurements of, we, we haven't spatially resolved the total irradiance contributions as far as I know. I'm just wondering if you had that kind of measurement, could you? Constrain your theory. Could you test your theory and um, perhaps? I mean, there's been some work that are trying to uh, measure the uh, latitudinal contrast and the mean photospheric mean temperature. That's by. Um, I mean, Kuhn and. Okay. Uh, but that's long ago. I mean, long time ago. It's it's hard to. Uh, it's hard to. I mean, there's always the risk of contaminating your. Your measurement with the uh, magnetic structures. Long time averages, I guess. Perhaps, but I mean, <coughs> uh, my guess. I'm, I'm guessing yeah. that, if, that if, if the mechanism you're discussing is responsible or makes a big contribution to the luminosity variation, then then uh, then, it, then you see more um, sort of a halo. I mean, Sunspot, it would the, the deficit in like the it. luminosity would be more diffuse or something like around that. the sunspot. That's what I'm guessing because you're, you're saying it's not, it's not if, if the luminosity change isn't just due to sunspot blockage, then maybe, maybe, and it's due to something deeper, then, then you're going to have a lack of flux around the sunspot. Yeah, there's uh, a that's the, the thing that that the thermal relaxation, the, the, the thermal heat capacity of the envelope is so huge. So anything you do to, to, to change the, the output at the surface, I mean, it's uh, this time, this relaxation time goes even, is even larger as you go down in the, in the convective layer. So perhaps if there would be such an effect, as I've shown, <coughs> in the granules at the surface, maybe you would see it. On the short, anything you can on the short time scale, would uh, have observational implications would be good. Yeah, yeah. I can't see it very clearly though. Yeah. Since your magnetism is at high latitude bands, um, how much modulation is there of the heat flux at low latitudes as um, the cycle progresses? Have you separated out things from? Yes, I've done some. I mean, I just look. That's just a. Snapshot of the uh, zonally average long, uh, la uh, enthalpy flux average in longitude, and you see that the contribution comes from the high latitudes. 
And so there's almost, I mean, the, the banana cells are aligned with the rotation axis, so they carry a little less flux in the radial direction. I mean, it, that's given we would it be able to detect banana cells in this, uh, those giant cells, or so. That's, yeah. uh, a significant uh, part of the flux is carried by kinetic energy. Uh, mm -hmm. How does that correlate with the magnetic cycle? I didn't look at that, but I was mo I was interested in mostly in the correlation between temperature and velocity. But re I mean, yeah, I, I need to look at how the it's part of the total flux. Right, so right, right. But the thing is that really, uh, yeah, it's a closed system, so there's nothing going out. Uh, ultimately, nothing comes out of the top of the domain because it's a closed boundary. Well, you have a Newtonian. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. So you have energy going up. You have energy going With through the system. Right. Yeah. But you have no mass going through. No. I yeah. realize yeah. that. So you, yeah. Because you have your kinetic energy at the very top. But still, through the simulation, how the, the kinetic energy right. flux correlates with the magnetic cycle. That's something I need to look into. So in some studies of solar uh, entropy, luminosity is compared with the hydro and the energy gas. And then in the calculation, in the, for example, we can calculate the by calculation. So when we introduce a magnitude, the uh, entropy covered the flux is reduced. So this is the opposite direction of this study. So what is the essential difference of so the, the comp comparison between hydro and the energy and the maximum energy? Okay, uh, is it a global simulation you're talking about? With uh, with those, with the cyclic magnetic activity? Yeah, so in Newton's case, this is that kind of Okay, and you've seen that the uh, enthalpy, enthalpy flux is reduced at yeah. maximum? That's, that's interesting. I mean, it's essentially due, I mean, it depends on the magnetic topology. Because if you, the, depending on how you, you suppress flow, you're going to get a different, uh, uh, inflow, outflow of heat in the downflows, in the outflows. So I don't know the answer to that, but I could. I, mean, I guess it could be related to. So one, one comment. So recently I did some high resolution calculation. So I also see some increase of the temperature perturbation. So with different mechanisms. So in the highest resolution calculation, so small scale convection is suppressed by the magnetic small scale magnetic. So this suppresses the mixture between upflow and downflow. So this increases the temperature perturbation. So, so m maybe this cannot be achieved with global calculation because a uh, huge yeah. point is required. But uh, it's interesting to see the resolution dependence of this design. Yeah. Maybe this can be increased. So the motivation can be increased with the higher resolution calculation. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I mean. Right. Yeah. Uh, under certain circumstances, these simulations produce uh, magnetic variations on two distinct time scales. And I'm just wondering if this type of analysis would help localize the, the source of those possibly distinct items. Yes. Um, I mean, there's in this simulation, there's a double cycle, uh, especially close to the subsurface layers. Uh, you can see it in the temperature uh, signal. It's a three to five years uh, cyclic signal close to the equator. And um, I've, I think I've, I've seen such uh, this time scale in those when I looked at the uh, convective, I mean, those divergences. And I've, I've seen the time scale in those <coughs> structures. So yes, um, the thing is that um, there could be, a, I mean, that those two mechanisms, those two cycles, are spatially segregated. Segre segregated. So perhaps, I mean, I mean, my guess is that they are perhaps operating with different mechanisms. I mean, not independent mechanisms. But yes, I would say it could help. I mean, because the, the, the temperature signal, of course, is, is caused by the 
convective flow modulation, but I haven't looked at that either. In particular, I just focus on the long, long cycle. But this is the same simulation that shows those double cycles. Yes. Yeah. 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 And you say you've seen is those this uh, double cycle has been seen in other experiments of. No, in, in these experiments. I've yes. Seen yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know if uh, um, if it's if somebody else did. But, but so basically, can your analysis rule out the possibility that those two distinct cycles are, are connected physically, like two symptoms of the same underlying cause, even if, even if they are spatially distinct? Rule out the difference in the way they operate? In, could they both be arising from the same underlying source, or can you rule that out? I mean, so those this signal occurs, I mean, there's a paper that's uh, by Patrice Baudouin, my colleague, and I, I, I just looked at the temperature per, uh, fluctuation, and it's, it's located close to the equator, uh, really close to the equator, whereas I've used, I've, I just focused on uh, studying those uh, upflows and downflows at high latitudes. So I, yeah, I mean, and those, here you have banana cells close to the equator. So my guess is yes, possibly they could, you know, oper be operating on different types of regimes. It's based on the... Yeah.